All right. Welcome uh, to our Sunday School Hour at El Paso Bible Church this morning. We're going to resume uh, our study in Revelation today, Revelation chapter 14 primarily, though we're going to review, I think, the last half of chapter 13 a little bit. Um, and we ought to start with the reminder of the nature of this portion of Revelation, and that is that for us, it is um, not precisely a warning, because these are events that, to the best of my understanding, interpretation, and reading of Revelation, we are not present for, not just Revelation, but other significant portions of the New Testament. Uh, that this is uh, information uh, for people that will be uh, alive and surviving and, and suffering these things that are taking place on the earth at that time. Uh, so it's important for us to know this information. It's particularly important for us to know this information uh, because, particularly because we need to know what it is not. And, and you may not understand what I mean by that, but there are a lot of people running around right now like a chicken with their head. Um, trying to figure out where we are in the book of Revelation, where we are, what events are taking place right now that we're supposed, who's the Antichrist, what are, what are these things going on, are we supposed to start having meteors falling from the sky, well we may have some of those things happen, but precisely where we are in the book of Revelation is somewhere in the interim between chapter 3 and chapter 4, <laughs> these events are future. They have not taken place yet. All right, are we any better now? Got a little delay. How are we looking? Am I on? Yes. Do I just hold it down until it turns off? There we go. All right, it's off. Okay, so uh, it's similar to what G.K. Chesterton said. Uh, he said that without education, uh, you're at terrible, horrible risk, or something like that. You're at a horrible risk or, of not being able to understand the unimportance of events. That makes sense. You, you need to be educated in these things so that you can understand the relative unimportance of these events. Um, we cannot say that this is both, which there are copious quantities of people who look at the world right now and say they're called amillennialists. They look at the world and say that this is supposed to be the kingdom of Christ. This is supposed to be Jesus' rule on the earth, and the church is supposed to be doing that. We're doing a miserable job, if that's the case. We need to be raising armies, because it's not working. Uh, there are copious quantities of people also who consider this to be the tribulation, that this is now God's wrath being poured on the, on, on the earth. Both of them need to step away from those substances that they're reading, that they're taking while they're reading the Bible, because we have very explicit events that have not taken place, that are not taking place, cataclysmic geological events, cataclysmic astronomical events, very literal specific events that we should be seeing taking place if we're supposed to be running around looking for where revelation is taking place in our current thread of history. Where we are is what the uh, normally dispensationalists understand to be the parenthesis between the church age and the restoration of God's working in Israel, which is the tribulation after the rapture of the church. And the world is doing what the world is doing and what the world does. It is falling to pieces and walking around in darkness and following after the prince of the power of the air and the God of this world, and that's just what happens. Um, and so we are understanding that these events are not something that were taking place. We're not supposed to be looking for political figures that are that are somehow figuratively fulfilling these roles that we read about specifically in chapter 13. Uh, so let's read those again because that's, that these are things that are important. 
Uh, when we were going through Zechariah, you know, we, we said, uh, as long as the Mount of Olives is in one piece, we know that Jesus hasn't returned yet. Like, because we expect the mountain to literally split in half when his feet touch it. So as long as we can look at the Mount of Olives and it's in one piece, we know that these events haven't taken place. There are some things like that here. Uh, chapter 13, verse 11 says this, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and it had two horns like a lamb and spoke as a dragon. Now when he says that this is another beast, this word for another is another of a similar kind or of the same kind. So they're, they're related to the previous beast that we, we talked about here. He exercises all of the authority of the first beast in his presence. And he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. Remember, he was struck down with a, a mortal wound and was healed. The first beast was the Antichrist. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. And people tell me that that sounds like a, a fiery speaker at a political rally. <laughs> okay. Ridiculous. Okay. He deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given to him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. Now, guys, don't, to use an archaic word, do not suffer fools. Do not suffer people who try to make that into something other than what it is. This is uh, the establishment of global idolatry with a very specific image of a very specific being who has had a very specific event take place, received a mortal wound that should have killed him, and was healed. And so we have that. He had the wound of the sword and has come to life. And it was given to him to give breath to the image of the beast, so that the image of the beast would even speak and cause as many as do not worship the image of the beast to be killed. And he causes all, the small and the great and the rich and the poor and the free men and the slaves to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. And he provides that no one will be able to buy or to sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for the number is that of a man and his number is 666. So are you supposed to be worried about getting tricked into having the mark of the beast? Because this is what I was, I, in the church that I grew up in, they were kind of worried about this. We would have kind of these big uh, uh, revelation prophecy conferences. And when you walked away, you were worried about, at that time, we were worried about getting a debit card. Our debit cards were terrible, weren't they? They didn't work half the time. Half the people didn't accept them. They didn't work. You couldn't buy or sell with them, much less without them. I mean, like, it was ridiculous. But everybody was worried about having a credit card or a debit card because they were going to get accidentally be bearing the mark of the beast. Foolishness. What is the mark of the beast? Is it a barcode? Is it a microchip like you get for your puppy? You all have your puppy microchipped? Pretty soon the public schools are probably going to demand your kids get microchipped with the vaccination record for COVID. Is that bad? I'd say so. I don't register my chickens, my guns, or my kids. None of them. I don't register things. Is it the mark of the beast? No. It's absolutely not the mark of the beast. And it's foolishness to say that it is because it's not one mark, right? It's a number. Six, six, six. Not six, six, four. Not six, six, three. Not zero, two, three, four, one, eight tattooed on your forearm. Because where is it? On your right hand or on your forehead. Are you supposed to be worried about accidentally taking the mark of the beast? No. You will willingly, whoever gets it is going to willingly take it. Because they won't be able to buy Cheetos and beer without it. Or whatever. Tamales. Tacos. They're not going to be able to buy or sell or do anything. They're going to willingly take it because it's just going to be that simple. But you're not supposed to worry about that. The same way you're not supposed to worry 
about trying to fit future events into the parenthesis. You're not supposed to worry about which presidential candidate is the big A antichrist in whatever country it is. You can almost kind of understand why the reformers considered all the popes to be antichrists because of the way that the Vatican views their political activities and the fact that it is a state and that there is in some sense a revival of a Roman Empire, but even they were wrong. They didn't realize the historical period in which they lived. You need to recognize that history runs in cycles and the God of this world is the God of this world and he's fairly boring. He, he's not innovative. He does the same things over and over and over and that's why our human history looks the way it does. Doesn't it look cyclical? Well, they say those who don't learn history are doomed to repeat it. Those who do learn history are doomed to suffer while everybody else repeats it. It just happens over and over and over and over again. All right, so here we are. That, those are the sp some specific events we're supposed to be looking for. We're not supposed to be looking for. The world will be looking for at that time. But again... We're trying to be educated because without education, we cannot understand the unimportance of events, right? You said that a minute ago. Some of y'all weren't here. The, we need to be educated in these events so that we know exactly what we're looking for, so that we can recognize the unimportance of the events that are currently going on relative to this. We need to know what these events are so we know that all the events we're watching, as bad as they might be, as stupid as they might be, as much as the American electorate apparently is full of ignoramuses, that it's not those. It's bad, but it's not that. Do we have a global idolatry system being set up? No. No, we don't. Do we have a <laughs> people calling down fire from heaven to destroy people who refuse to engage in the global idolatry? No, we have cancel culture which is a bunch of pansies that get their feelings hurt over and over and over with money and influence. That's not global idolatry. That's just a bunch of pansies. Anyway, let's continue. Chapter 14. And then I looked, and behold, the Lamb was standing on Mount Zion. Uh, just so we're clear how we interpret the book of Revelation... Who is the lamb? Who's the lamb? Jesus. The lamb who is standing as if he had been slain. And what is he doing? Then I looked, and behold, the lamb was standing on Mount Zion. What is he doing? What does it look like? It looks like Pastor Josh standing, right? Does this look like a, a figurative reality at all? No, it looks like a guy with two feet standing on a mountain. I, I'm sorry if that sounds ludicrously simple, but, but people might, <laughs> they're going to say things about stuff like that like, as if it's some sort of political movement in Israel. conservatives or liberals or whatever and they're coming to power and they're standing on the Mount Zion. No. We're looking for an individual with a form like a lamb standing as if slain. That's who he is. Standing on a mountain. And with him 144,000 having his name and the name of his father written on their forehead. So what's the picture? One guy the Lamb, standing with how many people? Is it just a multitude? What does the Bible say when it's just a multitude? An innumerable, uncountable multitude, like the sands of the seashore, the stars of the sky. Wow, that was powerful, wasn't it? Did you hear that echo? Let me turn that down a little bit. 144,000 people. So if you go and you count them, you're not going to get 143,999. You're not going to get 145,101. You're going to have 144,000. And you're going to be able to count them because they're distinct, aren't they? 
They have the name of the Lamb and of his Father written on their foreheads. What does that not leave room for? The number. Now, you might say, Pastor Josh, you've got a big honking forehead. There might be room for There's not room for both. We've already been introduced to these people. They've been sealed already. They were sealed. And, and, and in fact, the angels and sorry do not bring harm to the earth yet until these 144,000 are sealed, protected, preserved from whatever else is brought upon the earth. The 144,000 is a static number. They don't die, they don't suffer, they don't, they're, they're sealed, protected. In this case, this is not the same thing as when we talk about in, uh, in Ephesians 2, or excuse me, Ephesians 1, when it says that having heard the message and having believed the message, you were sealed in the Holy Spirit. It's not exactly the same thing, but they were sealed in this position, in this protection. That's what the context says. They were physically preserved from this harm. And I heard a voice from heaven. Where did the voice come from? Heaven. Did it come from Mars? No. Did it come from a loudspeaker in Washington, D.C., behind the big fence? No. Did it come from the Communist Party of China? No. Where did it come from? It came from heaven. Heaven, heaven. There's another heaven that we're going to talk about. But this is heaven, heaven, where God lives, I think. Uranus. The sound of many waters, and like the sound of loud thunder. And the voice which I heard was like the sound of harpists playing on their harps. Meaning it wasn't objectionable, even though it was loud, I think. Pleasant to listen to. And they sang a new song before the throne. The sound of many waters, right, all together. And before the four living creatures and the, the elders, those, the 24 elders who sat on the 24 thrones were before the throne of God. And no one could learn the song. So it sounds like somebody who's used to using a hymn book, trying going into a church that sings choruses, doesn't it? We can't learn those songs. Yes, you can, but these people can. No one could learn the song except the 144,000 who had been purchased or redeemed from the earth. So in addition to the, imagine that 144,000 people, right? 144,000 people on the mountain with the lamb. The voice is from heaven, like a sound of thunder. Harpists playing on their harps, and everybody joins together. Imagine the volume, just sheer volume of the voices. You know, in a, in a room this size, It doesn't take many people making noise to overpower people's attention, does it? It happens sometimes, right? You have a three-year-old, right? Maybe in the back corner over there, he says, boy, that boy's fat, talking to me. Everybody said, well, now we're stopping. We just stopped cold, didn't we? What does it do? Focuses your attention on the little chubby three-year-old in the back corner. Imagine what everybody in the world does <laughs> when there's a voice from heaven, voice from heaven like a harps playing on a harp, loud like thunder, like this, and 144,000 people all congregated on one single mountain raise their voices in a song that they can't learn, that they just can't sing with. Going to focus their attention entirely on it. These are the ones who have not been defiled with women, for they have kept themselves as 
virgins. The word is parthenos, parthenoi. Some people have speculated in commentaries that simply just because of the the cataclysmic events on the earth that these guys just haven't been able to get married. I'm not sure that that may be overly simplistic. (laughs) They have kept themselves chaste. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. These have been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And no lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless. So, they're virgins. They've kept themselves chaste. They're one singular job. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. That's why they're on the mountain with him. They've been purchased from among men as first fruits to God and to the lamb. Now, you may realize that there is a, a group, a cult, a um, cult, on this earth that it originally started and said that this 144,000, those, that, those are the people that were going to get saved, right? I told his witness, and they said, there's just going to be 144,000. The rest of you guys are out of luck. There's no way. You can hear that message all day long. You can believe that message all day long, but only 144,000 people are sealed, period. Then they had to renege because they got bigger than 144,000. Jehovah's Witnesses are like that. Uh, They're missing something in this statement. And that is that the 144,000 are the first fruits. Now, if you go back and you study the the feast of the first fruits and the sacrifice of the first fruits, what was it? At at the time that the first fruits was offered, it was 100% of the harvest, right? They didn't just go out and harvest and they said, okay, well, this is the first fruits. We'll put that over in the closet over there. And, and we'll go f- and finish the harvest because who knows what's going to happen. And we're going to bring it all into the barns and then we'll go sacrifice it. That's not how that worked. They were supposed to take the first fruits offering, stop cold in the harvest, and go and present that to the Lord as 100% of the offering. As an expression of faith that God was going to keep his promise. What was God's promise regarding their crops in the promised land? They were going to be bountiful and abundant as long as you obeyed. So the first fruits was key to bringing in the rest of the harvest. The 144,000 are sealed here as the first fruits. They're the guarantee that 100% of the harvest is still to come in. An expression of that faith. That's why it's important, though, that we discuss the difference between what it, being sealed in the Holy Spirit in Ephesians 1 means versus being sealed here by the 144,000. Um, there are a lot more of those words that we ought to ask that question. We've talked in the last few weeks about uh, we, when we see the word saved, we say saved from what? When we see the word dead, we say what kind of dead, right? What, what kind of death are we talking about here? What of the seven or more ways that dead is used in the Bible does dead mean in Ephesians 2.1, for example? What does it mean? What does it mean to be sealed? Well, of course, a letter gets sealed with a signet ring. Proclamation gets sealed. A verbal proclamation could be sealed by somebody just simply carrying the seal. I hold up my ring because I could use this as one if I wanted. It's got an engraving in it. It doesn't have my name on it. Although, I will say this, I I did create a custom brand for the furniture that I make that is my signature. I could use that as a seal because I got tired of burning it by hand and it didn't look that good anyway. So I could use that. Different ways of sealing things or being sealed from different things. The statement of sanctification. What are you sealed from? What are you sealed to? We're sealed to the Lamb. And no lie was found in their mouth. They are blameless. Are they morally perfect? Was that the basis on which they were sealed? That word blameless also is used in the New Testament for being above reproach. Somebody of of high character. Similar to the requirements for elders and deacons, actually. 
do we require absolute moral perfection of elders? I think I missed that in our Constitution. Did we, we missed that bill. I, I don't think I missed that. I, think, I don't think that's what the word means. They, but they are of high moral character and committed to their role as uh, being sealed, as proclaiming the truth of who the Lamb is, who the God is, and worshiping Him and glorifying Him and going with Him wherever He goes. And joining in that chorus from heaven. Verse 6 is this. Uh, I think I'm covering my notes mostly. Yeah. Okay, we, we mostly covered it. If I miss something that sounds important, let me know. I don't think I will. Verse 6 is this. And I saw another angel flying in mid heaven. There, there are a lot of angels, right? It's part of Revelation. There are a lot of angels doing a lot of angel things. Flying around in mid-heaven. Now, we know from other places in Revelation that mid-heaven is where the birds fly. Right, so that, is it heaven? Yes, it is heaven. It's mid-heaven. It's where the airplanes fly and the birds fly, the air, the oxygen, the atmosphere of this earth. There's actually a specific word for it. And I saw another angel flying in mid-heaven having an eternal gospel. It's like the Billy Graham of angels, isn't it? Not hardly. An eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth. Now, what does it mean that it's an eternal gospel? Well, gospel is a Swiss Army word. It means good news, right? You can say this is, this is good news of this, good news of that. There are, very quickly, there are at minimum three that I can think of, right? There's the gospel of the kingdom, Right? So when we read that in the, in the synoptic gospels particularly, and Jesus and John the Baptist both say, repent and believe because what? Because the kingdom is near, is at hand. They do not say, repent and believe so you can go to heaven when you die. They don't. That's not what they say in the synoptics. Repent and believe, for the kingdom is at hand. That statement is a statement given to Israel, preparing themselves for an earthly kingdom and king to come and establish a kingdom on the earth. Get yourselves ready. It's a, a physical reality, a political reality that they were proclaiming to them. It's a statement, in my opinion, that was spoken to people who believed in the Messiah. And, and what, I say that because what does it matter if you don't believe that the kingdom is at hand, if you don't believe that the kingdom is future, if you don't believe that the kingdom is coming, what good is repenting and believing? Right, that was the rationale. So you need to repent and believe what? You need to repent and believe that the kingdom is imminent. It is on its way. It is coming. And so I think it's a mistake to assume that all of those people that heard that message, which many people do, are unjustified. How are people justified? How did they go to heaven when they die? They believed specifically in God's promise of a Messiah, particularly from the line of David, particularly as a seed of the woman, which is very particular, who would crush the head of the serpent of the line of David, a priest in the line uh, here. I mean, like, there are certain things, right? But essentially that they believed that God would send a Messiah. Now, it seemed to me that the whole country lived in expectation of that. They had believed that. What they needed to do was to prepare for them to come. And, and I can look at the, the gospel record and I can say, well, um, there actually is a minority of people who did not seem, who seemed to outright reject this concept. Uh, and John even makes that distinction. He's not one of the synoptics, but he always refers to the Jews as the ones in opposition, and he's referring to the Jewish leadership who rejected him. So we don't want to make that mistake. We don't want to confuse the gospel messages, because there's also there's the gospel of the kingdom. It would be preached to anyone, regardless of whether they were justified or not. If they were a member of that covenant nation Israel, they needed to repent and believe, for the kingdom is at hand. Some of them might get justified in that process, but equally unjustified or justified people needed to believe it. Then there's the gospel of eternal life, right? Jesus says this, he who believes in me has eternal life. 
That's the central message of the Gospel of John. That's how you go to heaven when you die. That's how you get eternal life when you need it. In Ephesians, we would say that the, Paul described it as this. You believe the message, or you heard the message, you believe the message, you were sealed. We'll talk some more about that later on. And then we have this, the eternal gospel. What does it mean that it's an eternal gospel? It means it's true all the time. And all the time, it's good news. But what is it? The current eternal gospel to preach to those who live on the earth and to every nation and tribe and tongue and people. Everybody. He said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come. Is that how to go to heaven when you die? It was for everybody, unbeliever and believer. Are there believers on the earth? There are 144,000 of them standing on a mountain with the Lamb, aren't there? Minimum. First fruits. There are likely others. At this point, I mean, we're not not prophets and we're not uh, told specifically, but there are people who are both rejecting Jesus. If there are people who have the opportunity to reject Jesus, even while the world is literally crashing down on their heads, we ought to understand that there may be some that are believing in him due to those same evidence. But it's for all of them. How is it good news that the hour of his judgment has come? Anybody want to take a crack at it? I'm sorry, Clara, I'm old. Speak up. We're already in heaven at that point. This is the tribulation. We're out of here. Okay. Eh, sorry. Next. <laughs> oh. So, yeah. Yeah, that might be it. That might be it. That might be it. Oh, yeah, because sin will be no more, she said. That's the answer. Because judgment will come on the earth and sin will be dealt with. I think Daniel said something about that. Bring an end to sin. I think that's closer to it. Uh, That people um, who have believed in Christ, that's an end to their suffering when the wicked are judged and the evil are judged. I think that's it. Is that good news for everybody? Yes. Judgment has come. I mean, there's some corollary actions, right? There's some necessary actions. Fear God, give him glory, worship him who made the heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of waters. Turn to God at this point. Judgment has come. You can still do it. There's opportunity. But for those who have already believed in that message, of course, it means that all of these cataclysmic events are soon to be over with. And another angel, a second one, followed saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She who has made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. What's Babylon? These aren't trick questions. What's Babylon? Is it Chicago? San Francisco? San Francisco is a pretty nasty place, isn't it? Run by communists. Lots of cities are. Are they Babylon the Great? No. When it says Babylon, what's Babylon? Might just be Babylon. It's amazing. Might just be Babylon. What, Sarah? Did you just say Babylon? I can't read your lips. That's all right. She said Babylon. She wants to be right. It's Babylon. She has made all the nations drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. There's an end to that when judgment comes. How many more minutes we got here? Ten more minutes. We'll make it seven more minutes. Then another angel, a third one, followed them, saying with a loud voice, 
If anyone worships the beast and his image and receives a mark on his forehead and on his hand, he will also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is mixed in full strength in the cup of his anger, and he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. They have no rest day and night, those who worship the beast in his image, and whoever bears or receives the mark of his name. Well, this is why everybody in that church I was growing up in was real worried about accidentally taking the mark of the beast. They didn't want to put that debit card in their wallet. Didn't want their social security card to be implanted under the skin of their body or something. Can you accidentally, let's, let's review that. Can you accidentally take the mark of the beast? No. What is the mark of the beast? It's a number. Is it a serial number? No. It's a number. Everybody gets the same number. It wasn't given to you in a prison, it wasn't given to you in Auschwitz. Okay? Those were serial numbers. This is one number. And you're not going to take it accidentally. You're not going to be able to buy Shiner Bach and Crunchy Cheetos without it. And people are going to really want to buy Shiner Bach and Crunchy Cheetos with all the world going around. As long as they have their social media accounts, Shiner Bach and Crunchy Cheetos, the average American will be just fine. Right? They're going to get a stimulus check. They'll pay all their bills. Forever. Money that they shouldn't even bother blowing their nose with. It's all going to be fine. Yeah. They're going to take it willingly. And it's not going to be accidental. But that's the reason they were worried about it, was because you, the, the consequences of taking it are pretty severe, right? You don't want to do that accidentally. Just for the sake of Cheetos and Shiner Bach. You don't want to do it. You can't do it. But if anyone does at this time period where it's possible, has the mark on his forehead and on his hand, there's going to be no question as to whether they're guilty. They're going to be walking around with it. Right? It's like uh, when, when my boys were little and Gideon was little, we used to catch him. Uh, he, Gideon's not here, so I can tell this story. Of the two twins... Gideon was the one that we always caught like this, red-handed. He'd have a whole sack of cookies open in front of the TV in the living room in Garland. Still in diapers, the little sinner. He'd have a mouthful of cookies, crumbs falling out of his mouth. And you'd say, son, did you eat all the cookies? He said, mmm, mmm, These people have this thing tattooed on their forehead and on their hand. They're guilty. They didn't do it accidentally. They did it willingly. And they're going to feel the wrath of God. Now some people will try to say, they, they, uh, we have an abbreviation for it because this conversation comes up so, so often uh, in theological circles. It's, we call it ECT, eternal conscious torment. Do you, and they'll just give you a short end, do you believe in ECT or do you not believe in ECT? And I am one who reluctantly believes in ECT, eternal conscious torment. I wish that it wasn't true. I understand some of the objections to it. How, how can a temporal, finite, fallen being in their trespasses and sins commit a sin that is worthy of eternal conscious torment? I'm not positive. I'm positive as to God's character, who does what is righteous, who does what is good, who is just. But I, I mean, I, I want... But we don't get to wonder. We have the text. And the text, yeah, Becky. It's probably why it says in the Bible, God takes no pleasure. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, there's not a parade here. Yeah, she says that's why the Bible says that there's, he takes no pleasure in the, in the punishment or the, or the death of the wicked. Agreed. Uh, there's definitely no parade here. This is, this is a, a thing that takes place. 
And it, is, it has witnesses, and I want you to understand also that the audience here is the holy angels. There is a point to this. This is not a theater that everybody in the whole universe is invited to. There is a point to be proven to the angelic host. And that is the nature of sin, particularly, right? Because we could say the same thing about Satan, right? So he wanted to sit in the big chair. Was that worth what he lost entirely? Was that, what, what was, did the punishment match the crime? Yes, it did. Yes, it did. And in fact, humanity emulated that sin in the garden, actually. They wanted to be like the Most High. So they did. They tried. But people will argue, I don't know how you argue against what we call eternal conscious torment with a verse like this, right? They'll say something about the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever, as if, so they call themselves maybe annihilationists. They believe that after, they may, they may be tormented for a time, but at some point they are no longer conscious. They're no longer in existence, but it is the smoke of their torment. There's always a memorial to their judgment that goes up. And you could say that if you didn't have the rest. If you don't exist, what does it matter if you have no rest day and night? It doesn't matter. You wouldn't say that about somebody who doesn't exist. Well, it's, it's hard work not existing. You need to take a break. You need a vacation from that not existing business. That doesn't work. Those who worship the beast in his image and whoever receives the mark of his name this is coming, right? The, the hour of judgment, the angel said. All right, we're going to stop there. We got the rest of 14 to go, and, and the imagery is pretty deep, I think, in those last verses. So we're going to hold off till next week. Any questions or comments? Observation. I'm sorry? In what chapter did we go to heaven? After chapter 3 and before chapter 4. Way back there. The vast majority of Revelation is not about you and me. That's why we say that it's important for us to understand. Oh, what chapter did we go to heaven? I'm going to get this one day. I already answered it. Somewhere between chapter 3 and chapter 4. The reason that we, we take that is because of the way that we read Scripture, and we don't insert church where there is no church, right? So there are words like saints, justified, the righteous, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, in between chapter 4 and chapter 21, I think it is. But that doesn't mean church there. Church means church, right? So we, we, we're not present there. The viewpoint is from heaven. John is taken up to heaven to see these things. As a member of the church, we understand that. There are other passages that would tell us, um, such as that we're not destined for wrath, right? Um, and Thessalonians. And so we, we put this together uh, as a, a theological argument. To me, it's the only one that actually makes sense of all of the texts that are relevant. But in other words, this is for our instruction, and that's why I opened with that instruction also, is that we need to be educated in these things so that we understand the unimportance of events. We need to understand that while a lot of things are going on that are significant and important to us in our lifetime, they're not those. We're not supposed to try to place ourselves into events that Scripture has not placed us in. All right? Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, makes it difficult. All right. So chap some, after chapter 3 and before chapter 4 is when that takes place. Anybody else? Questions? Comments? Accusations of heresy? You'll run into a lot of people that don't believe that. You will also find that people that don't believe in what we call the pre-tribulational rapture also oft often do not believe in eternal security. They do not believe that once you are sealed in Christ by the Holy Spirit, like Ephesians 1 tells us that we are, that you are in fact permanently God's possession, that you now have to, 
endure to the end of the tribulation, which they figured, make figurative and allegorical, being your lifetime or the church age or whatever, and that, you, that there will be some believers who have to suffer, some members of the church who have to suffer through the tribulation events in order to finally be saved and redeemed and glorified, that they have to do that. But not everybody has to do that. That's the weird thing, is it places you on all sorts of different footings. So some of you only have to endure to the end of the Cold War that ended right in the end of the 90s, and people had to endure to the end of that. But some of you will have to endure the seven-year tribulation just to go to heaven when you die. That doesn't make any sense. God wouldn't, I, I just, that doesn't even make biblical, common, logical, any kind of sense to me. But just be aware that the vast majority of the church out there today does not hold to premillennialism, much less a pre-tribulational rapture. They just don't. So you'll run into arguments all the time. Just tell them that Pastor Josh disagrees and they're wrong. Just kidding. Tell them that the Bible disagrees and they're wrong. And remember some of these things, okay? Um, but you can send them my way. All right, that, that was a joke, folks. But listen, you, you have to play fast and loose with a lot of Bible to come up with amillennialism and, and post-tribulationism, which are the polar opposites of what we hold here at El Paso Bible Church. And I'm not kidding about that, and I'm not overstating it. All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Uh, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that we can read it as it is written, that we can understand it, and we can understand our place in these events, particularly, that we can understand the unimportance of events as well as the importance of these biblical events. Father, we do love you, and we know that you love us, and we're very grateful for that. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen.